How to be unbiased. How to be a good citizen. Hello everyone, this video will differ from my other videos in a sense that it will not focus on either global or US history regions. However, it will cover something more important, skills to be unbiased and open-minded when it comes to politics. So most of my viewers are high school students who are preparing to take their regents exams. So in a few years, when you guys become 18, you will be able to vote. And that's a very precious right. There are a lot of people in this world who don't have that right. And what I'm going to try to emphasize in this, in this video is although you guys are going to have that right, it's important that we use that right correctly. That whether you're a Democrat or Republican or whether you vote for a third party, you have to make sure that you know when you're voting for someone, you know why you're voting to, for that person. And for that reason, it's a good to be unbiased. So, let's go over it. What is unbiased? So what is it? Well, that's when you don't show any hatred or prejudice towards opposing political views. And it's very difficult in today's world, but that's being unbiased. When you are unbiased, you are also open-minded. Open-mindedness is an ability to listen to any opposing views and to change yours if, if their arguments are better. You know, I've changed my personal views multiple times since the time when I was in high school. And some of those views were uh, the types of use which I felt very strongly about. But, you know, open-mindedness is a very good thing. And, you, of course, knowledge. Knowledge is power. you got to know your own views. you got to know what you believe in. And you got to know what the position believes in. So, even if you have that particular view that you feel very strongly about, that's good, that's good. But you also have to know about the opposing view. So this way you can formulate your view correctly. And if you ever in a debate with someone from the opposition, <laughs> you know, you'll handle that debate without any problems. And you know, an ability to filter biases in the media. We're going to talk about that as well. You know, in today's world, the media can affect the way people think about a particular issue. Whether you know it's whether you're watching CNN or Fox News, <laughs> yeah. Opposing views can be shaped by the media, unless you know how to filter them. And we're gonna talk about that as well. Republicans versus Democrats. You know we have a two party system in this country and whether you like it or hate it, you know, if it's a big election, or in even a small election, for the most part, you know, if you're going to vote for a third party candidate, well, we do have third party candidates, like, uh, from third parties. For the most part, uh, as harsh as it sounds, you're going to waste your vote. Because third party candidates have no chance to win, for the most part. So, most people who want their candidates to actually win have to choose between Republicans or Democrats. And, you know, when you're dealing with Republicans and Democrats, you have to know the difference between the right wing and the left wing. It, the, these terms actually came from uh, the French National Assembly during the French Revolution. That's where right wing conservatives and left wing who are more who are commoners were sitting but oh, we're not going to get into that so conservatives versus liberals uh, I want to emphasize that not all Republicans are conservatives there are some very liberal Republicans and not all Democrats are liberals there are very conservative Democrats out there <laughs> but for the most part 
most mainstream Republicans try to be conservative and most mainstream Democrats try to be liberal. So conservatives, they're more traditional and less willing to change. Uh, for, for the most part. Liberals are more willing to embrace change. So, you gotta know these terms. And people from both parties tend to be guilty of religious attachment to their ideas and to their party as well which is wrong because it creates bias so it's sort of like religious loyalty that's the term I'm trying to, to emphasize so and you know sometimes when a person leaves that party or doesn't even leave that party or supports the opposition now let's say if it's a Republican who voted for Democrats, for a Democratic candidate, or a Democrat who voted for a Republican, you know, some people from their parties will consider it as a as betrayal of their ideas, and that's wrong, you know. People should be free to vote for whoever they want, and people people from both parties tend to have, be guilty of religious attachment to their ideas and their party, which is wrong. It creates bias. And we want to avoid that. So whoever you in the future, whoever you want to vote for, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, you know, you have to make sure you know why you voted for that person. And you have to make sure you know the issues. So as you know, Democrats and Republicans, they don't really like each other. And they have bad differences on how to govern this country. They have vast differences on many issues. And two of the biggest issues that divide them is, has to do with their views on social programs and economy. So let's talk about Democrats. So most modern day Democrats tend to have socialist light. Not to be offensive, I'm not trying to be offensive, <laughs> and it it's not necessarily bad. So it's socialist light views on this issue. And it's not to be confused with pure socialism. Socialist light basically means they want more uh, social programs. So that, you know, the lower class benefits from these programs. So, most Democrats believe that a large government should help people by funding and even increasing funding of social programs. Some examples would be welfare, food stamps, social security, health care, free education, etc. So the idea is, big government should be able to help people. It has the money, it has the ability to do it, so let's help people. That's how a lot of people who cannot do it without the government. But someone got to pay for it, right? So all these social programs are nice, but someone's got to pay for it. But who? Well, Democrats have a proposal. The way to raise the money, according to most Democrats, is through taxation, mostly on the rich. The idea is that we need to redistribute, redistribute the wealth from those who have a lot of it to those who need it. And what's going to happen is this will increase consumer spending because they will have more money and thus it's also going to improve the economy because when a lot of uh, I'm going to use the word people in the lower class would have a little the money to spend bigger on products such as you know clothes, food, etc. Because they don't have to spend on, uh, on healthcare and education and etc. If they have that money, then you know it's gonna help drive the economy. So it's when, so the idea is we're not just helping the poor just for the sake of helping the poor. This will also drive the economy because the poor are going to have the money to spend. And it's also going to decrease the crime. 
that's another issue. Uh, the Democrat, many Democrats would argue that because you know people, poor people, people in lower uh, class will have that money, they won't have to, you know, resort to criminal activities to get gain that money. In order for them not to resort to that, they need to have that money with them, and these social programs will help them. Of course, I'm not trying to put all Democrats under that <laughs> set of, these set, set of definitions. Uh, it's mainly for mainstream Democrats, and this. Uh, these are their views on social issues. All right, now let's take a look at Republicans. Most modern-day Republicans want to limit social spending, so they want to do the complete opposite of what most Democrats are proposing. Their proposal uh, stems from an idea that government should spend less money on social programs. So. If you remember from your high school history, there was an idea of laissez-faire. Laissez-faire means no government interference in the economy. Now, most Republicans know that pure laissez-faire is not realistic. It's unrealistic, so they just want as less government involvement in economy and welfare as possible. Just let it you know, guide itself. An invisible hand is going to help the economy. They want less taxes for everyone, including the rich. So Republicans want less taxes for everyone, including the rich. Of course, you know, if there, if there are less taxes, you know, you're not going to have that much money to spend on social programs. So they want less taxes. And they have a theory on how to deal with this economy. It's called the trickle-down theory. Trickle-down theory basically means if rich have more money, they will invest in the economy by creating jobs. And eventually it's going to benefit everyone else, including the poor. So the benefits will trickle down on everyone else. That's, uh, I mean, this trickle-down theory is at the core of the Republican Party today. That if rich have more money, they will invest in the economy by creating jobs and everyone's going to benefit through that trickle-down theory but, and everyone's going to benefit so let's say a rich person will have more money by not paying that much taxes and a rich person let's say he builds a factory or builds a large company and now that he built that company, he's going to hire those people. He's going to hire everyone else. That's the idea. And thus the benefits are going to trickle down on everyone else by them getting jobs, so to speak. And they have a vastly different idea from Democrats about welfare. Their idea is states that people need to get jobs and get off welfare. Basically, they want people to get a job and get off welfare as soon as they can. They don't want people getting welfare. They want people to get jobs and get off welfare. But it doesn't necessarily mean that Republicans are against all social programs. They know it's not realistic. And they know it's impossible to cut all social programs. They want to live in them. They want people to have as less as possible in terms of social programs. So as you can see, Republicans and Democrats have two completely different philosophies when it comes to social issues and the economy. And these are the issues that unfortunately divide them. I and mean, neither party is willing to compromise on these issues. I mean, there are some Democrats and some Republicans who do see a need for some sort of compromise with the other party, but most of them 
at least today, tend to stick to their core principles. Immigration. Examples on how to be unbiased. You know guys, when I started this video, I wanted to discuss an idea on how to be unbiased, how to be more open-minded. And in order for us to do that, we need to look at some examples on how to be unbiased. And let's take a look at this issue. The issue is immigration. And an immigration is a very, very, uh, very divisive issue for both Republicans and Democrats. And if someone is very biased about that issue, they're not going to be open-minded to opposing views. And that's what we want to avoid. You can be passionate about that issue that you believe in. It's good to be passionate about that, about an issue. But at the same time, you don't want to be biased. So, let's take a look at the difference between biased and unbiased. So, in, in this case, let's discuss the Republicans. So, biased Republican. When it comes to immigration, this would last could be his or her views. So, liberals hate working class Americans and want to flood this country with legal and illegal immigrants, drug gangs, and terrorists. They want to take away our jobs and turn these immigrants into voters. Let's deport them all. That's their solution. Let's deport all of these immigrants. Because, you know, they're coming over here, they're competing for our jobs, and, you know, as a result, less jobs are available. So, as you can see, that person has a very, very biased view about immigration. Do you think that person will be willing to compromise on any issues? No. As you can see, he hates immigrants from well, from his arguments. And most biased Republicans, uh, or at least many of them, will refer to Democrats as liberals. They'll use the ideology of, li of a liberal to refer to Democrats. Alright, now let's take a look at unbiased Republican. This will be his or her argument when it comes to immigration. This country is in a deep economic trouble and simply cannot sustain uncontrolled illegal immigration. We need to give these jobs to our own citizens. We need to make sure people come here legally and we need to vet them, means to carefully check who they are in order to make sure that they're not a threat to our national security. And we don't want any amnesty to legal immigrants. Amnesty means if an immigrant, immigrant has been here illegally or for a while, an amnesty means they can become legal. So, what's the difference? Well, both biased and unbiased Republicans, they want to limit immigration. But an unbiased Republican is more open to immigration as long as it's legal. But neither one of them, for the most part, is willing to give amnesty to undocumented immigrants. And, but the difference is an unbiased Republican would not be, I mean, deporting all of them is not going to be high on his list. So, as you can see, there are some similarities, there are some differences. So, if you have a Republican, if you're a Republican and you have a view on immigration, it's better to be an unbiased than biased. And this, these are some examples of the difference between two views. Of course, there are many other views that Republicans have. These are just generic differences. Immigration. So. Let's take a look at biased and unbiased Democrats. So, 
bias Democrats. So a biased Democrat, similarly to a biased Republican, is going to be very, very close-minded to any opposing views. And, in fact, they will be very, very hostile to any opposing views, just like a biased Republicans. You know, a biased Democrat is just as hostile as a biased Republican. So, these are just examples of how a biased Democrat would argue about immigration. Republicans are a bunch of racists who hate immigrants because they're different. These policies are an exact copy of what Hitler and the Nazis did when I wanted to build a pure German society. Multiculturalism is the only way to prevent this. So, as, as you can see, this person is very, very hostile to Republicans. Just like a biased Republican was very hostile to Democrats. And a biased Democrat will likely believe that when Republicans want to limit immigration, they're racist. That would most likely be their main argument. And they will have a view something along the way of multiculturalism, meaning we should have many different cultures in this country. And multiculturalism is the only way to prevent you know, prevent what, what happened in Germany and multiculturalism is the future, basically. No, not by a Democrat would argue something along those, these lines. This country was founded and built by immigrants. We need immigrants to do the jobs that most ordinary Americans would not, you know, you know, most immigrants do very, very low-paying jobs. And another argument would be that they actually help run our economy by doing these jobs that most Americans would not be willing to do. And no human being is legal, so let's create a process for legalizing them. Let's make sure they're legalized. It will be a humane way of dealing with these people. We live in a very globalized society. Well, it is true. You know, we live in a globalized society, and we need to embrace multiculturalism. So, as you can see, a non-biased Democrat does not start his argument by you know, going off at how racist Republicans are or how biased Republicans are. The arguments run along the lines of why we need immigrants. And in some ways it is true. I mean, this country was built by immigrants. And In the 19th century, there were huge waves of immigrants, including the 20th century. Huge waves of immigrants, and unless you're Native American, your ancestors came here from somewhere else. So, these are their arguments. Of course, I don't want to put all Democrats under these definitions. These are just two extreme ones. You know, the biased example is the very, very extreme example of what some would argue. I did hear those arguments, by the way. Just like I heard biased Republican arguments. <laughs> An unbiased Democrat is someone who is also very passionate about this issue, but he or she 
are willing to explain why we need immigrants and why we need to legalize them. So, you see the difference between biased and unbiased? This is what we need to try to do. So when you guys finally get to vote, it's okay to be passionate about an issue, but you should try to be un un should be unbiased about this issue. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat about and whether you feel for or against a certain issue, you should not only try to be unbiased about that issue. Media bias. The media can be your friend or your enemy when it comes to acquiring new information. If you know how to filter the biases, then you'll be alright. You know, one thing that you have to remember is never trust any media that's been 100% correct. So, me personally, I follow the media, of course, I have to. Otherwise, uh, I'm not going to know what's going on. I mean, I need to know the news. I follow the media. But it doesn't mean that I have to, you know, believe in what they're saying as being 100% true. You know, media is run, is run by people, regular people. A lot of those people have agenda. A lot of those people want to shape your views. Do not allow them to shape your views. You know, otherwise you are allowing the media to brainwash you by shaping your views to match their intended purpose. So let me show how to let me show you how to do this. <laughs> Alright. Media bias. So let me search about some news on the Trump budget. In order for us to gain a Republican perspective on the issue, we need to look at the media that tends to support Republicans. In this case, the best example is Fox News. <laughs> so, I found an article on their website written by Brooks Singman and it's titled Donald Trump's budget spending cuts are moral, Mulvaney says. So, by reading this article, I see that the author is quoting Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney, who, by the way, works for Donald Trump. He works in his administration. So, when he stated that President, that President Trump's budget calls for 3% growth rate and a balanced budget within 10 years. So, since it's like a Trumponomics. That's the idea that they're using on, on a Fox News website. Trump, Trumponomics. So they sort of going back in history. And you know, remember Reaganomics. So that's Trumponomics. So it also talks about tax cuts. Which is the core of Republican beliefs like we discussed earlier. So how to filter this bias? Well, let's say I'm a Democrat. And I just read Jesus, this New York's article. So how would I filter it? Well, I would know that it was published on Fox News, which tends to support Republican views. You know, this tells me that they will likely publish positive news about Republicans. And as you know, Trump is a Republican. You can argue that these cuts will only benefit the rich. And the growth is unrealistic. You know, 3% growth rate and bonus budget within 10 years. Good luck. <laughs> you can, you can, you know, you can disagree with this article, but by reading it, you will know what the opposition thinks about it. And it's good to know opposing views. So, if you feel passionate about anything, it's good to know what the opposition thinks. It's good to know their mindset. Otherwise, you know, if you just call opposition as being foolish, you know, if you just call them names, you're not accomplishing, accomplishing anything. So it's good to know their views. 
All right, so let me do another search for some news on Trump budget. In order for us to gain a democratic perspective on an issue, we need to look at media that tends to support Democrats. And in this case, we're going to look at CBS News. So I found an article on their website written by Amy Bitchy, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. So it's titled, Trump's budget says poverty aid doesn't work. Is that so? All right, so is that so? Just from this question, just from the title, we can tell that the author holds a vastly different view from the author on Fox News. Just from the title, that's what it tells us. Just from the title. So this article begins by telling us that the budget would cut about 1.74 trillion dollars from social safety net programs, such as food stamps and disability. Uh, so with an aim of getting people to work. It then argues why people need these benefits in order to work. So remember when I discussed uh, the core differences between Democrats and Republicans and how Democrats would generally support social safety nets? This is another example of that. So how to filter this bias? So let's say I was a Republican. <laughs> so how would I filter this bias? Well, I know that it was published on CBS News, which tends to support Democratic views. And the arguments fall in line with what Democrats traditionally believe. And it's true. Democrats traditionally believe that people should be getting uh, social, social programs. And you can argue that these cuts are necessary in order to balance the budget with our huge national debt, you know. Republicans always tr try to look at our debt. And so it's good to know opposing views. But if you limit yourself to just, you know, Fox News if you're a Republican or CBS News if you're a Democrat, then you're not getting the full picture. I mean, try to look at all the news sources out there. This way, you will know about what the opposition thinks and you are less likely to be brainwashed by anyone. You will form your own educated view about an issue, which is a good thing, which is what educated you know, citizens should be able to do. Bias in the classroom. High school and college, you know, that's where it's most likely to, likely to be prevalent. You know, I highly doubt any teacher is going to discuss politics with a first and second grader. You know, <laughs> but uh, it's mostly happening in high school and college. So as educators, we have to make sure that students are able to learn the required information without our personal views. You know, when children are young, they're still developing and are very susceptible to brainwashing. So, no one is born a Republican or a Democrat, you know. People's ideas are shaped by their experiences. You know, I, personally, I had many teachers and professors who were passionate about their views, which is okay, which is great. Yeah, if you're passionate about a, a particular view, that's great, that's excellent. Some held democratic views, while others held, you know, republican views. <laughs> but very few bad ones try to shape our political opinions, and educators, teachers, professors should never, ever do that. It's terrible. You know, there were times in my life when I felt very strongly about an issue because my teacher told me about it. And the way that they described it, you know, really got to me, got on my nerves. <laughs> so I was biased. 
at the time towards any opposing views, especially when it came to an issue that my teacher discussed. So, most people are biased. Most people are, and I'm not a human. So, educators should never, ever do that. Ever. As students, you can filter your teacher or professor's bias by simply ignoring it. Only remember what you need to know for your class and nothing else. Shape your own opinions. You know, that will make you smart. That will make you a good citizen. You know, it's okay to ask your teachers or professors political questions. In fact, I think it's great, you know, if your teacher or professor encourages political debate. Especially, let's say, if you're in a history class, that's great, you know. I'm assuming that they allow that. But, do not guarantee a debate with them. <laughs> you heard your grades. It's even okay to pretend that you believe their views by agreeing with them, you know. Hey, they're your grades. So. Try to form your own opinions. You're smart, you can do it. <laughs> and hopefully you have a good teacher, and most of the teachers out there are great. Most of the teachers out there are excellent. So hopefully you have a good teacher, and most professors are, out there are great as well. And hopefully your teacher is able to educate without shaping your views. Without intentionally shaping your views, that's would be a better way of phrasing it. So, let's continue. You know, the country is highly divided between Republicans and Democrats, between the right wing and the left wing. And really shouldn't. Because after all, we all live in the same country. We all want this country to do great. We have vastly different views. But at the same time, there's no reason why our views couldn't be compromised. We shouldn't stick to our views religiously. So, let's go over the 2016 presidential election, which was, in my opinion, one of the most divisive elections in American history. So, as you might know, we don't elect the president in this country by a popular vote. It's done through an electoral college, and we're not gonna get, get into too many, too much, too many details about that. But basically, the goal is to get to 170 electors. It's based on the number of electors that each state gets, and that number is determined by the population. There's a census that's being taken every 10 years, and. The state can either lose or gain electors. So, as you can see, uh, when it comes to an electoral system, Donald Trump won by getting 304 electoral votes, as opposed to Hillary Clinton's 227 electoral votes. Even though, if we count the people's votes, popular vote, uh, Hillary Clinton won that vote. Six, you know, she, she had almost 3 million more votes than Donald Trump did. So let's take a look at this map. As you can see, you know, in New York City, I mean, New York, New York State, you know, tends to vote Democratic. And Hillary Clinton easily won that state, and it's 29 electors. And California as well, you know, 55 electors right there. These two states have a lot of people. But the interior of the country, which is not very populated, but there are a lot of states out there which hold vastly different views from what we hold in, you know, in big cities. And they overwhelmingly voted for Trump. What really wanted for Trump was 
Pennsylvania and Florida. You see Pennsylvania and its 20 electors. Hasn't gone red since Reagan. I think, yeah. And so did Florida, 29 electors. So these states are known as swing states. They can go either way. Is it a fair system? That's debatable. That's debatable. I'll not take sides on this issue. <laughs> but this is why Trump won because of this system. If we had a popular system, popular voting system, then we would need an electoral college. Daniel Hillary Clinton should be our president. She, if we would have had a popular voting system, she should have and would have been our president. It's just the way it is. But based on the map, you can see how divided we are. You know, historically, the South itself has a vastly different views from the North, from New York City, from New York State, and from you know from California. So country is very divided and one way to unite the country is to eliminate biases try to find some common ground try to find some compromises and this way we can try to overcome our differences good luck so hopefully you guys learned something about bias the reason that I made this video was because this country is very divided and it's up to our youth, which is the future generation, which is you guys, <laughs> to unite it. You guys are the leaders of tomorrow, and it's important that you are aware of why we need to be less biased with our views. It's okay to be passionate about an issue, you know. There are many political issues in which I'm passionate about. But we must be aware of opposing views, and we have to be less biased, if we could. You know, I did not cover all political issues in this video. It's impossible. <laughs> Just some examples. And it's up to you guys to research whatever issue interests you, from both perspectives. You know, try to get both Democratic and Republican view on an issue. Even if you disagree with the opposing view, you know, it's good to know what they're thinking about it. This way you become an educated citizen. And when you become 18 and get that right to vote, you know, you vote matter. You will know that you will actually matter because you're voting um, by being informed. You're voting with that information in front of you. So this was a short break from my usual videos and I'll get back to making videos about history soon. <laughs> you know, I don't like making videos about politics. I really don't. I just felt that this video, you know, I had to put it out there for you guys to see. Lastly, I'm aware that some of my definitions did not fit they don't fit all Democrats or Republicans. I did my best to try to explain their mainstream views in the most unbiased way that I could. Please forgive me if some of my definitions were offensive, as this was not my intention. You know, me personally, I did not disclose my political views in this video, which was my intention. <laughs> So, and I will not disclose them now, but I'll just tell you that I don't like Democrats and I don't like Republicans. I really don't like Republicans. <laughs> so I don't like both of them. But anytime I vote, I look at 
an issue that I'm passionate about. And once I found that issue, I look at the candidates. I don't particularly look at any political party, I look at the candidates. And once I, once I find a candidate that whose views fit mine, that's the way I usually vote. And if I don't like either Republicans or Democrats, I don't vote. <laughs> you know, you should, I always tell you that you should exercise your right to vote, but in a big election, like a general election, the truth is, if you're not going to vote for any of the big two, big parties, with Democrats or Republicans, you know, you can't, if you, a third party has no chance to win. So if you're going to vote for a third party, they got no chance to win. That's the sad truth about it. I mean, you can vote for anyone, for a third party or anyone, but in, in all likelihood, they have no chance. That's the sad truth about it. The only way for them to have a chance is we need to eliminate the two-party system. Then it would work. But right now we have a two-party system. Alright, so good luck. And I'll make new videos soon about history, not about politics.